Cynthia, and just give us your impressions. Okay, hi. Uh, hey, him. Yeah, uh, my name is uh, Fitri. Um, I'm from uh, the host country, Indonesia. Uh, unfortunately, I'm just arrived by today. Um, oh, okay. All right. <laughs> um, actually, I'm just arrived by today. So this is my first day uh, joining the IGF. Um, I don't think I have a significant impression because I've just arrived. But uh, I'm expecting, because I'm, I'm studying for uh, defense management uh, for defense ministry in Indonesia, but I'm expecting a particular um, session that I can gain information on um, cyber security. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. OK, someone else? Your impressions. <laughs> hey, I'm Ana Lucia Lenis. I'm the policy counsel for Google in the Colombia, in the Andean region. And this is my first time in the IGF, but I was, um, uh, well, <laughs> it's, but I was for, um, organ uh, in the Latin American IGF that we had in Cordoba a few months ago, and then the last year, because the Colombian government and the technical community organized the regional IGF. So I suppose that uh, some of you uh, have uh, attended the, the regional IGFs, and I think it's a good opportunity uh, to to spread all the ideas or all the messages that we shared in our own regions and see that uh, sometimes we have same concerns and uh, it doesn't matter if you are in, a, in the other side of the world, like me, <laughs> in this moment. Uh, so this is an invitation to share all the, the, the ideas or the um, concerns that you have in your own countries because sometimes you have the surprise that someone from a very different uh, country have the same concerns and they have a lot of good information, data that you can use it. So this is an invitation to uh, maybe not be shy and have a conversation with all the people that you don't know and maybe you can find a very, very interesting contacts and information for your own projects and ideas. Thank you. Uh, someone else? Good morning, all. My name is Sonegi Tuepe. I work for Crossover State Government in Nigeria. Actually, I've had um, a little experience of the internet governance scenario because I did some courses with Diplo Foundation and had attended the West African Internet Governance Forum. Now, my delight in the internet government arena is to see a system where bilateral and multilateral agreements are guaranteed, and further providing a platform to run a global governance where all citizens will feel equitable. Here I am sharing good experiences with experienced uh, multi-stake players and I've been able to network with people that could grow my information base and expand my horizon. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sonny. Uh, do you want to share your, your expectations or your impressions? Well, thank you. My name is Subhi Chaturvedi, and I come from India. I teach at a women's college, and I run a foundation called Media for Change. This is my second IGF. Um, the first one was at Baku. And as someone who's seen this unfold and become a new initiative um, practice person, to see something like this come together in such a seamless manner, which brings people from different cultures, from different spaces, with different problems to solve, and to work in an environment of collaboration, and to learn so much every single day. I think it's been a fantastic experience so far for me. I'm now a member of the multi-stakeholder advisory group, and we hope to put together sessions which benefit people across cultures, communities, 
and to resolve and address questions of access and diversity. I do want to welcome all the new participants because I know the sense of awe. I've been in your position and not too recently enough. Um, I, I think it is a wonderful space to be at. However, I do want to say that it can get a little overwhelming because there is simply a lot that is happening. There are many rooms and there are many topics of interest. I would urge you very strongly to go through the itinerary, to also look at the website and see the workshop sessions that interest you in greater detail. The, you can divide your time and you can maximize the input that you take that way. A little bit of homework, being a teacher, I can't help but say that, always helps and goes a long way. Um, I, could, I could just, for tips and tricks, I could get a lot out of the last IGF because I spent some time in my hotel room even when I was exhausted after long days in dividing my time and running between workshops, just to look at the workshops and the panelists and what they had to offer. Um, I want to leave you with a small example because for us questions of access mean different things. For India, access would mean putting a billion people who are not connected online and connecting them. But for different people, access defines different things. So um, look at the workshops from that perspective. Um, and also, I, I think this is a wonderful melting pot of cultures and there's just so much to learn from each other. So I, I welcome you to this beautiful world, which is the IGF and about the internet that we all care so much about. Thank you. Thanks, Subi, and I know you are supposed to be speaking on behalf of Teresa, so we'll be calling on you shortly. Um, I think we, we can now go into the first session, which is, um, we'll have three speakers. Uh, the first session will be on internet governance principles, and I am not sure, we've had so many exchanges of emails, I am not so sure now who who actually confirmed because on the program I have Inga, but I'm told it's not there. There's a name. Is it Max Gay or something? Anyway, out of the resource persons, who was tasked to speak on that? On multi-stakeholder, on, on, on internet governance principles. Okay, um, well, we sort that out, Subi. Uh, could you please take us through uh, the principles of multi-stakeholder cooperation? Sure. Um, I think the paragraph 39 of the Tunis Agenda talks about different stakeholders, including academia, the technical community, civil society, governments, um, state actors, people from across different sections who make sure that the internet is up, running, and functional, and accessible, and open. Um, some of the core values that we cherish in terms of the internet itself are openness, interlopability, freedom of speech and expression, permissionless innovation, and all of this can happen and flourish because there are different stakeholders working in different spaces and doing their job and doing their job well. Um, a lot of conversations have existed in silos. When we talk about something as exhaustive and important as multi-stakeholderism, which wasn't originally a part of the Tunis Agenda, it is important to understand, and that is what the Tunis Agenda talks about, that each of these stakeholders should play and perform their rightful roles and responsibilities. Now, this becomes a tough one, especially for civil society to be part of these spaces because we do understand that there are certain stakeholders who exercise more power, who have more access to these conversations on governance. Um, let me also take a step back and talk about the two aspects of what we are discussing, internet and governance. So, of course, there is the physical layer and there is the content layer and there are these conversations and then there's the commercial aspect of corporates making sure that the private sector 
provides the infrastructure for content and innovation to happen. Um, as far as multi-stakeholderism is concerned, there are many definitions, and during the course of the main focus session that we will run, um, we will leave it open and see it as a bottoms-up, inclusive, transparent process of coming up with our understanding, our own individual understanding of multi-stakeholderism, and that's how we've structured the main focus session. So you will see an unconferencing of the session unfold. There will be no panelists up on the dais. You will have two very capable moderators and facilitators who will go around talking to people, and we will have flip charts, we will have notes passed around where people will respond, where the entire community will respond to questions of multi-stakeholderism and their understanding of multi-stakeholderism. So when we say that all, all the actors have to play their job and their role well, what do we mean by that? Um, we do not for, for even a moment disagree that the government has a huge role to play when it comes to facilitating conversations because the inter internet is not something which is sovereign. The internet is transnational, so there are boundaries which are crossed and there are agreements that have to occur. But when we talk about a process which is multilateral vis-a-vis multi-stakeholder, there are several issues because it privileges one stakeholder over the other. Multi-stakeholderism talks about inclusivity, it talks about transparency, it talks about accountability, and it talks about a process which is, again, bottoms up, inclusive, and consultative. The theme of this IGF is building bridges, and we couldn't have articulated it better because it is about reaching out to communities, it is about understanding different problems, and it is about approaching these problems with an open mind where solutions cannot simply be negotiated, but can be, you can appreciate dissent and you can come to a point of consensus. And this consensus building is what the IGF does. And that is what we hope that the main focus session on multi-stakeholderism and enhancing cooperation can achieve, to hear more, to listen more, and to understand different points of views from cultures which are as different and as similar as they come in terms of region-specific issues, in terms of geographical issues, in terms of its people and their own indigenous needs and problems. We believe the IGF has a great role to play because it brings different stakeholders together. It also allows people to ask difficult questions and it allows governments to respond to those questions and also understand and get a sense of the community. So I think it is a, a, a beautiful concept in terms of multi-stakeholderism, but yet because it is so wide and it is so all-encompassing, we have a long way to go in understanding where each of the stakeholders stakeholders come from, what is the role that we can play. Um, for example, governments in the private sector have played a wonderful role in facilitating more participation from developing countries, especially from the youth and women and marginalized communities, especially from vulnerable communities whose voices are often not heard. So I see this session as an important session. I see this session as a crucial session because it feeds into the very core of what the IGF stands for, which is transparent, inclusive, bottoms up and not a top-down process. I think it is a wonderful platform to be heard and to make sure that our voices count. So that is my understanding of what we will offer. I invite all of you to join us at the main focus session, and if there are any questions, I'd be very happy to respond. Thank you. Thanks a lot, to be Very well uh, said. Um, you, you, you actually pointed out when you started about um, WISIS process, and I'm going to ask Alex Caminos to just expound on that, at least for the sake of the newcomers and the relationship to IGF. Okay. <clears throat> Does anyone know the context through which the IGF arose or um, how long it's been around? Uh, the IGF follows uh, a, a process which was called the World Summit on the Information Society. Um, and from there, uh, if we want to know about the principles, there are the, the, the WISIS principles um, and the Tunis Agenda. So, so these are the documents 
And I think the other issue about principles is um, we are certain, to a certain extent, are here to uh, debate principles, and perhaps that that process is open. Um, and interpretable, uh, we may come up with new principles, but we, we're also here to to decide how we can turn principles um, into to, to something deeper. But yeah, I think yeah, multi-stakeholderism is a principle, for example, and um, we still need to to flesh out what that means and how we can enhance cooperation. Um, but perhaps we could have a veteran who's been through these processes to flesh out the principles. I'm sure there's someone in the room. Don't be shy. Uh, thanks, Alex. Um, we'll still come back to the, the, the principles um, if the speaker is um, available. Uh, but as, at this point, I would like to... Is Patrick around so, so you'll speak on behalf of Patrick okay uh, so we'll ask it's Lucia it will ask Anna Lucia uh, to talk briefly about um, the legal and other frameworks that uh, relate to spam to hacking and to cyber crime thank you well, you know, if we want to talk about spam hacking and cybercrime in three, five minutes, it's impossible. It's, there's a lot of issues around the 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 this this um, the debate about the regulation, the problems uh, that are behind this kind of uh, issues. So, I want to mention some the the relationship between the the say, spam, the hijacking, and the, and the security, and the, all the tools that we have available to protect uh, our accounts and our uh, uh, from for the hijacking and for other kinds of attacks. So it is it is very important uh, to to talk about the uh, this relationship with other uh, with with all the tools and all the facilities that all, uh, we have available to protect our own accounts. So I want to highlight that we have a, a web page that where you can find a lot of information. It's, uh, it is called, is it, it is good to know. And uh, this web page is a guide to staying safe and secure online. And there's a lot of tips about how uh, uh, Google security or the, to, uh, or, the, or the responsibility or, uh, or the invitation that we have to, to uh, explore the security and privacy tools that are available to protect our information. Uh, some tips about secure, uh, how to uh, create strong passwords and keep the information safe. You know, it's, uh, uh, I'm really surprised that uh, at this moment, uh, you can see, for example, in a different office, uh, uh, offices in Bogota, in Colombia, that people that have their own password in a post-it in front of the computer. <laughs> because it's, a, it, it's, it's crazy that at this moment uh, there's a lot of people that they don't care or maybe they don't have the information or how to protect their own information. Um, another, uh, and, and you know, all the uh, people that are behind the the cyber attacks, the hijacking, uh, compare, uh, are trying or are, are working uh, in more sophisticated tools to have access to the information. So, in the other side, we have the responsibility to protect our own information and our accounts. So, compared to five years ago, more scams, illegal, fraudulent, or spamming message today come from someone you know, for example. And this is something that this is, is changing. Maybe to, uh, five years ago, you received uh, an email that looks very suspicious, and you say, "Okay, I don't want. I, I'm not. I'm sure that this isn't a spam." But right now, the, every day, it's more difficult to detect uh, the, the if it's a spam or not, or if it's an attack, uh, it's, a, it's an attack or not. So uh, uh, this is an uh, an, an, um, an invitation to. Uh, to include in the debate during these uh, days the, the idea of that the security 
is very important. It's a responsibility for all the stakeholders that are here, not only the companies, but we are we are doing the best that we can, working every day to have a stronger uh, tools to protect the, the data of our uh, clients. Are um, but additionally, it's something that is in, uh, related to the education and to the different uh, stakeholders will be included. Uh, included in this debate about how to protect the information and how to improve the, uh, edu uh, and the education in our countries uh, and take seriously this, uh, this idea of the security. So uh, I'm going to finish with this invitation. The, the web page is called It is Good to Know and it's available in different languages. Um, you can check the, all the tips that we have in this web page. Um, I forgot to mention that Ana Lucia works for Google Columbia. Um, now, the newcomers, at this point, do you have questions? All is good? Okay, Tijani. I don't have a question, I have a remark. You said that uh, the IGF has principles and we, uh, we have to change those principles. And also you said that you, we can also transform those principles into something deeper. I am afraid we will not be able to do so. We will need a UN General Assembly resolution to do so because it was decided in the Tunis Agenda uh, to create this IGF with a very sharp boundaries so we, we, we are not able to change anything without uh, a UN resolution. Thank you. Okay, uh, I will make a quick response to the cybersecurity issue. I really liked your talk, Ana Lucia, and I like that you bring um, cybersecurity to the individual level. Um, what I also think is important, and I've noticed this IGF has a lot of talks about cybersecurity. Um, the lady in the corner just asked, the, after this session, there's two cybersecurity workshops in parallel. Um, what I think is also very important is multi-stakeholderism in cybersecurity. Cybersecurity started off um, as something that the technical community did, and then when the internet was commercialized, it became the responsibility of the commercial community. Recently, it's become part of government's responsibilities. So what you call that process is actually securitization, whereby something becomes a national security issue. But we really, what has been lacking in cybersecurity, because it is traditionally a cybersecurity issue, is a true multi-stakeholder discussion, and by which I, I mean including civil society and netizens. So just a brief point. Uh, I think the gentleman there has made an excellent point. Perhaps um, I'm young and a bit naive. <laughs> One can't make new principles, and if you read um, any UN document, for example, at, at the beginning, um, you will have a preamble where it says reaffirming this principle and reaffirming that principle and reaffirming that principle. So um, it is uh, very good to, to, to work on principles, and uh, of course, if we were to just make our own principles, what, what the IGF was would, would, would disappear. Um, just to critique that, I, I have heard people say that, that for the past eight years since the uh, WISIS, uh, we have just been kind of repeating paragraphs, <laughs> which is a good thing because they're good principles. Um, now, I'd failed to answer the question before, but um, the beauty of the internet is you can take out your <laughs> favorite search engine and then um, find the actual document you're looking for. Um, it's better if you have a tablet so someone doesn't see it and they think you know the principles. But I've got them in front of me, and these are the Declaration of Princess Principles on the World Summit of the Information Society. Um, I think it's dated 12th of December 2003. Um, and I suggest you all look at that document. I think if you just search for WISIS principles, it'll come up in your search engine. Um, and I'm just going to give uh, the headings here for the Information Society key principles. Um, and the first principle involves the role of governments in the promotion of ICTs for development. The second principle is information and communication infrastructure is an essential foundation for, the for an inclusive information society. I think we can all understand that. 
access to information and knowledge is a very important principle. It's one of the pri primary reasons we have the internet. Um, capacity building is a very important principle, and I think that's 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 needed in, in in all sorts of forums and processes, and it's needed in the IGF more than anything else. And um, this is here an attempt at capacity building. Then we have building confidence and security in the use of ICTs. Of course. Um, the internet wouldn't work, processes wouldn't work if we didn't have confidence, security, and trust. We need an enabling environment. It's all very well to talk about this, but if people don't have access to ICTs, uh, if people don't have access to the internet, um, then we really are just talking. Um, there's ICT applications must benefit all aspects of life. There must be cultural diversity and identity, linguistic diversity and local content. There's principles about the media. There's ethical principles regarding the information society. There's international and regional cooperation. And then there's towards an information society for all based on shared knowledge. Now these are headings. Underneath it are 67 principles. And I suggest we all familiarize ourselves with this document, especially me. Um, and yes, if, if you want to, to flesh out these principles into agendas, into policies in the national sphere, and perhaps looking forward in the international sphere, then we, then we need to familiarize ourselves with these principles and work out how to flesh them out further. Thank you very much for your comment and keeping me on track here. Um, Atijani, actually, we, it's a response to him because we were going to come to... It's not, it's not a response, it's a compliment of what he said. Uh, the, el the 11 elements that you are uh, mentioning now are the, uh, the action lines for building the information society. There is 11, and you mentioned them all. And um, uh, those are, for the summit, if you want, the foundation of the information society. So. Uh, uh, can we change anything in that? I don't think so. So we have, we have to know them for sure. We have to, to build on them if you want. If you want to, to go further, you have to build on something which is done. Okay, thank you, Tijani. Now it's your time to uh, speak briefly about capacity building. Thank you, Grace. Uh, Grace, uh, I will speak about uh, I will speak about my workshop that will be held uh, uh, today in the afternoon, um, and um, which is on the internet as an engine for development and growth. This workshop is organized. I am organizing it on behalf of uh, Afralo ICANN. And um, I would like to say a few words about AFRALO and ICANN. What is AFRALO and ICANN? AFRALO is the uh, African Regional at Large Organization representing the Internet end users in Africa. It is one of the five regional at large organizations in ICANN uh, covering the five regions of the world. So if you are a, a, a civil society organization or an NGO or any other kind of uh, association of uh, end users, please join us uh, and uh, help defending the internet end users' interests in ICANN and more broadly the public interest. Now back to uh, uh, our workshop and back to the World Summit on Information Society. In fact, the first article of the Declaration of Principles of the World Summit on Information Society in its first, first um, phase in Geneva said that, I will read it, uh, the representatives of the peoples of the world assembled in Geneva from 10 to 12 December 2003 for the first phase of the World Summit on Information Society declare their common desire and commitment to build an information society that is people-centered, people inclusive, and development-oriented, where everyone can create, access, utilize, and share information and knowledge, enabling individuals, communities, and peoples to achieve their full potential in promoting their sustainable development 
and improving their quality of life. And since Internet is the backbone and the heart of the information society, we can easily say that the leaders of the world expressed in 2003 their commitment for an Internet that is development-oriented. But 10 years after now, is the Internet serving the development? And if it is not, how can it be an engine for development and growth? This afternoon, uh, our panelists will answer those questions and uh, will address from various perspectives issues like capacity building, multi-stakeholder model, multilingualism, local content, cooperation, and the uh, Internet ecosystem. The focus will be put on key points regarding the universal access and service policy at the global level, Internet as a driver for youth employment and uh, economic growth in the global south, how education and capacity building can make the Internet serve the development in Africa, the development of rural re uh, areas thanks to Internet in the Latin America and Caribbean region, and the role of Internet in creating and developing a sustainable business sector in those regions. I will stop here. I, I want just to remind you that uh, this workshop will be held in room number two, hall one, today from 2.30 to 4 p.m. Please join us, and thank you. Uh, thanks, Tijani. Do we have comments, quick comments for Tijani? Questions, clarification? All right. If there are none, um, okay. Sony? My question is, who are the classes of multi-stakeholder uh, multi that need this capacity building? Because I also observe that civil society do not understand the workability of government, so they just throw everything, bam, at the government. So how do this capacity building go among the multi-stakeholders? No, my question is, who are those to be involved in the capacity building among the multi-stakeholders? Uh, yes. Okay, Tijani, then Subi, and then I think uh, Alex. Everyone will be interested in capacity building, every, every stakeholder. Uh, capacity building is... Uh, I would say the most important element in the, um, uh, um, in the Internet for Development in general. Um, we need capacity building for uh, technical staff or technical engineers of the South so that they, they are able to, to choose the best uh, infrastructure for their country, for their situation, for their need, so that they will not be sold uh, infrastructure that, are, that is uh, uh, obsolete. We need capacity building for uh, uh, people at the grassroots so that they can uh, work on, on a keyboard, they can uh, uh, access internet. We need capacity building at all the levels. And uh, 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 civil society needs the capacity building, and civil society is one of the most important elements of the, of, uh, uh, of the, the capacity building. So uh, 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 civil society will be uh, uh, an, an essential element in the capacity building. Uh, the government also needs to, to, um, uh, to have the capacity building for their own um, staff and also for, uh, uh, they have to give capacity building for, for, the, uh, for the others, for the, uh, for the other stakeholders if you want. So everyone is interested in capacity building. Um, I can't agree more with uh, the comments of the previous speaker. 
not just in terms of interest but who should be involved in capacity building is a really important question i think when we talk about multi stakeholderism and true multi stakeholderism can only actualize when you have an informed community when you have an able community i might have all the right intentions but the way to hell is also paved with the right intentions in place if there is a skill set and a gap that exists in terms of technical abilities in terms of content in local languages in terms of access when we talked about access it's not just the cost of the physical device it is also what is it that we can get out of this wonderful empowering medium that is the internet internet as we see it is a tool it is technology it does not mean anything by itself it is a wonderful in terms of carrying information communication connecting people but what we do online is a function of how engaged how involved how prepared and how able we are as a community as far as what can governments do i think like the national education policy that we have in india where literacy is an issue digital literacy is an equally important question there are people who are online for the first time they're not literate but they're keypad literate and there are about 200 million in people that india has which is a unique number so i have my domestic help i have the person who delivers milk he's getting online and he's communicating using applications to deliver services and facilities i think especially in the context of emerging economies and developing countries governments have a huge role to play and so does civil society to create a ripple effect to create master trainers and master teachers who can connect communities and who can give voices to the unheard and so does the private sector um india has done a unique experiment which is talking about the usfo fund and this is mobile subscribers paying for bring bringing people from rural communities online and connecting 250000 village panchayats or local self governments i think that is the role that the governments can play so there is need for digital literacy there is need for capacity building and each stakeholder can have a role should be interested and should be performing their own rightful role thank you hi <clears throat> Uh, I, I would just uh, like to uh, fully agree that capacity building is a multi-stakeholder process. And I would just like to respond to the suggestion that perhaps civil society does not understand the role of government or how government works. And I think that's quite an unfair and unhelpful statement. I think you could also say possibly that often government doesn't understand how civil society works, but we don't live in separate boxes, isolated from each other. Many people in government have. Uh, been and worked in civil society before and the other way around as well as the technical community there's a, a great overlap uh, and much of civil society concerns itself with a daily basis on the work that government does and spends a lot of their times at forums like this participating in intergovernmental processes so um i can understand definitely we we all come from our own institutions and our and 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 these multi stakeholder groups can have different um cultures and beliefs and values and ways of doing things um but there is understanding between us we must foster that and we must grow that i think you, you maybe you meant they often do not understand or sometimes they do not understand but thank you for bringing the issue out and the capacity of building issue is very important so thank you also for bringing it up okay there's a gentleman and pl please tell us who you are and um your affiliation I have a comment to do but I need to do it in French. I say I have a comment but I need to do it in French. Can I go? Uh, <laughs> do we have someone Tijani will translate for us, okay? Okay. Je pense que c'est très imp... je suis Kosi Amesinu du Bénin, je suis Kosi Amesinu du Bénin. Je suis responsable informatique dans un ministère, le ministère en charge du développement au Bénin. Je pense que l'enjeu de faire de l'Internet un outil de développement est important. Mais la question est de savoir à quel coût on met en place l'Internet pour qu'il serve vraiment au développement. Je 
Je parle plus haut. Ah, ok. Je disais tout à l'heure que je suis Kossi Amessinou du Bénin. Je suis responsable informatique du ministère en charge et développement. Et j'estime que l'enjeu de faire de l'Internet un outil au service du développement est important. Mais la question est de savoir à quel coût on met en place cet Internet pour qu'il soit effectivement au service du développement. Développement vu dans l'espace au plus grand nombre. Offrir du, offrir du service au plus grand nombre. Comment faire On a des besoins élémentaires au niveau de nos peuples l'électricité, l'eau. Mais l'Internet aujourd'hui est considéré pour nous comme étant un outil pouvant booster l'atteinte des objectifs du, du millénaire pour le développement. Comment on fait dans la pratique pour que cela se fasse, mais à coût raisonnable Coût raisonnable veut dire quoi Que je puisse avoir accès à l'Internet, mais sans ignorer que j'ai aussi besoin d'avoir accès à l'électricité, j'ai aussi besoin d'avoir accès à l'eau au même moment. Est-ce possible qu'en mettant en place les infrastructures d'Internet, on mette en, en place une dynamique qui oblige les sociétés qui offrent de, de la capacité à nous offrir au même moment des accès à l'électricité et des accès à l'eau Est-ce qu'il est possible C'est vrai aussi que l'espace gouvernant de l'Internet, forum de la gouvernance de l'Internet, n'est pas un espace de décision c'est un espace d'échange, de partage d'expérience. Il n'est pas évident que même en prenant cela comme un engagement, les gens, les uns et les autres, se sentent obligés de, le, de mettre cela en œuvre. Comment on fait Quel type d'approche on peut utiliser Merci beaucoup. Je résume ta question. Je résume ta question. Ta question est de savoir à quel prix... Moment. I, I, I need to... OK. Ta question est de savoir à quel coût on peut avoir l'Internet, sachant que nous avons des besoins élémentaires euh, de vie, comme l'électricité, l'eau euh, et tout. Donc la question c'est à quel prix on peut avoir l'Internet pour les pays qui ont des besoins élémentaires. C'est ça Bon, ok. So, the question was, uh, what would be the, the cost of the Internet for people who have elementary uh, needs such as electricity, water, food, etc. Uh, is it possible to have the Internet at uh, an affordable uh, cost for those people? This is a generic question. And uh, it's, this is a question. You are the chair. <laughs> I think French is very fascinating because he spoke for about... Uh, five minutes and uh, you've only been able to translate in less than a minute. Um, I'm not going to respond to that now, but I'm going to go to Pablo um, and ask him to probably make a response to that and also speak very briefly about the critical internet resources. Hello, my name is Pablo. I work for APNIC, the regional internet registry um, for Asia Pacific. We distribute IP addresses in the form of IPv4 and most importantly IPv6 throughout um, the region in, in Asia Pacific. It's um, a very um, a fortunate thing to have the IGF in this side of the world, uh, in, in the Asia Pacific region. And we're very happy to be here. APNIC has historically followed the IGF since its inception. And uh, I would like to uh, say a few words about uh, critical internet resources. I was thinking about it this morning when I wanted to charge my computer. I think the most critical internet resource is obviously electricity. But anyway, this is a charged uh, concept. And uh, uh, as you can see, there is no uh, much mentioning of this subject uh, at this IGF, but critical internet resources was, throughout the history of the IGF, a main theme, a main topic uh, since Athens, uh, uh, Hyderabad, Rio, uh, Sharm el-Sheikh, and 
It was also a topic uh, very much discussed during the World Summit on the Information Society. That is actually where the IGF come from. And um, uh, actually, there was a lot of discussion during the summit that internet governance was about internet uh, critical resources. And um, uh, it was absolutely great that a group of experts, when uh, defining the concept of internet governance, decided to uh, give the concept a much more broader sense, a much broader meaning and included in uh, internet governance many other very important topics, not only critical internet resources. Uh, what it means, uh, critical internet resources during the WISIS process was basically internet addresses, domain names, and uh, IP numbers. And um, it is uh, uh, great to see that uh, the IGF has had a full agenda of uh, a diversity of uh, subjects and very important themes that obviously are part of an internet governance agenda. Um, obviously, as part of that are internet addresses such as domain names and IP numbers. Uh, this time, uh, it is not uh, a highlight of uh, or a main theme in the agenda of the IGF, uh, which I think is, is, is good and, and is bad part and part, but uh, there are different workshops that have uh, these issues, uh, particularly tomorrow, uh, I think a couple of them and a few others on, on internet addresses. Um, uh, anyway, this is a historical term, and I don't want to use uh, a lot of more uh, time just to say, hey, uh, critical internet resources is part of internet governance. And uh, it's an important one, uh, but it's not uh, an exhaustive one of, of the agenda. And there are many other topics as well to talk about. Um, I think that's it, and I'm uh, open for questions. There are many um, from the regional internet registries and the uh, internet addressing space in this room, as I can see. And probably they can answer questions better than me. Thanks, Pablo. Uh, do we have questions for Pablo? Um, we have about uh, seven minutes to get out of this room. Um, and uh, at this point, I want to give uh, the floor to any other person who would want to make um, an interjection, a clarification, or any comments on the topics that we have um, discussed today. And please uh, introduce yourself and your affiliation. So we'll go to the gentleman over there. Hello, <clears throat> good morning. I'm Thomas Piller from the Walt Disney Company. Um, I just want to come back briefly to the question uh, uh, from our friend from Benin. I'll just switch in French for 10 seconds, okay? That's my mother tongue. Euh, clairement, ce que vous avez dit, c'est une question essentielle. Euh, L'accès, effectivement, pour les pays en voie de développement. Je vous encourage à venir cet après-midi au workshop euh, 271 à 16h30, puisqu'on va justement parler euh, d'accès, de coûts, euh, d'infrastructures, euh, de contenu pour les pays en voie de développement. C'est exactement le, possiblement des réponses aux questions que vous vous posez. Hein, c'est vraiment ce sur quoi on va euh, se focaliser. Donc, si vous pouvez venir, ça serait, ça serait bien. I'm switching back into English now. I was just saying that actually there is a workshop this afternoon, number 271 at 4.30, that is going to exactly look at the questions from our uh, a friend and colleague from Benin, uh, which is going to be devoted to broadband access, cloud infrastructure, and content for emerging economies. And we have a few speakers from like Kenya, for instance. So uh, this is clearly uh, uh, a, a question which, which concerns all of us because Subi uh, eloquently talked about the, the main concept about Internet governance, but as she said rightly, this is a platform, this is a tool. The question is what do we do with it for all of us in emerging or developed economies? And that's one of the issues we're going to look at at 4.30 Workshop 271, I know that I'm kind of overselling it, but I think this is crucial because I think that we can talk as much as we want about the big 
concept, but the reality of it, as Subi again said about the initiative with the villages, is what impact does it make on people's lives every day around the world? And, uh, and, and there is so much more we could do if, if, if there were more people having access to it, again, in particular in emerging economies. So I'm um, looking forward to the discussion. Workshop 271, 430, uh, room number four. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, anyone else? Subi, you want to make some? And then uh, please remember we need to be out of here in the next uh, I'll, I'll keep minutes. it very brief. Um, there is a Twitter hashtag, IGF2013, and people can engage and put in your comments. They are very consciously, sincerely being retweeted so the world can listen to what you have to say about this very important issue. So I encourage you to engage, use social media, and uh, all of us, all the MAG members, all the old and new members, everyone's around in case there are any questions or queries or directions, because I do want to say it gets a little overwhelming. All of us are there. Please feel free to ask. And I think each one of us are learning so much more every day. So it is a wonderful platform, and I hope all of us can connect collectively make it work and make it better. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I think I want to close this session for now and to tell the newcomers that, um, you know, IGF has a lot of acronyms. Uh, DIPLO has um, done a bookmark with all the acronyms. If you can walk to their booth, uh, it's just down the corner. You will get a bookmark with all the acronyms, and they will be useful because um, this field, people talk in terms of acronyms. And if you don't get them now, you will, you might, um, you know, you, the IGF might lose you. So please make that effort. Uh, so I want to thank all of you for really um, finding time to come. This is an early session, uh, and the fact that you have sat here patiently. And for the newcomers, um, there is actually going to be um, the IGF principles in this room starting at 9.30. So you're welcome to stay and to learn more. So thank you, everybody, and see you around. Thank you, Chair. Testing. <laughs>